Well, thanks so much for joining us, uh, Professor Mahoney. We appreciate your time. Uh, I'm Mike Hartman, co-editor of The Giving Review. Dan Schmidt, another co-editor of The Giving Review. There are three of us, uh, is with us. And we would love to see if we can chat with you a little bit about, uh, well, the new encyclical. Uh, first, just let me introduce you. You can rebut anything I say. OK. Uh, but we'll be brief here. because My dad, I'll rebut anything you say, but uh, I'm well, looking yeah. <laughs> Let's play it by ear. I okay. mean, we'll have a, we'll have information, you know, about your background in the article of which this video will be a part as well. But uh, uh, Daniel Mahoney is a professor of politics at uh, Assumption University uh, in Worcester, Mass. Author of several books, some of which will be listed, I'm sure, in the in the article. Uh, and he writes widely in the popular press. His most recent book is, and we have props, the idol of our age. Uh, how the religion of humanity subverts Christianity. Uh, and we might talk about such subversions, perhaps even including recent ones in a little bit here. Uh, his most recent article is up, uh, on Catholic World Report on the new encyclical of Pope Francis called Fratelli Tutti. Uh, we will let him tell us what that means uh, when we ask him about it. And, and Professor Mahoney is one of the principal founders of the Liberty and Justice for All project, which is uh, seeking to develop unity about the meaning and practice of American citizenship and civic education and constitutionalism. Uh, so we thought him the perfect person to turn to for uh, a conversation short uh, uh, about this new encyclical because we at the Giving Review, of course, try to pay attention to charity and how it's uh, considered uh, by people like the Holy Father and, and, and those who, who read encyclicals. Uh, well, okay, Professor Mahoney, well, what does Fratelli Tutti Mean. Well, it's a quote from Pope Francis, and it's an evocation of the brothers all, yeah. uh, of uh, uh, an invocation of human brotherhood. And so, uh, of course, the, 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 the self-proclaimed topic of the, the Pope's new encyclical, which was released on October 3rd, is what he calls uh, social friendship and, uh, uh, and brotherhood. Um, and uh, yeah, and it's... Uh, Ostensibly, the encyclical is a reiteration of, you know, age-old Catholic and Christian wisdom about the human person and uh, brotherhood. But I think there are many striking and even disturbing innovations. And uh, it's an interesting question, but Pope Francis likes to innovate perhaps more than a pope is supposed to. Um, it's, a, it's quite remarkable if one looks at this document, how many of the citations are to his own speeches and how quick he is to sort of redefine, um, uh, you know, for example, I'll give you one example that several commentators have pointed out. Um, the Pope says something that I think is un incontrovertibly Catholic teaching that uh, the right of private property is, always should serve larger social purposes. But uh, he adds that the right of uh, private property is not inviolate. But uh, an encyclical like Rerum Novorum, the first uh, social encyclical of the modern church issued by Leo XIII in 1891, says explicitly that private property is a natural right that is inviolate. Inviolate doesn't mean that uh, private property doesn't serve social purposes, but it means it's a right that cannot be uh, abolished without doing grave damage to human dignity and freedom. Uh, so uh, that's just one example where the Pope uh, claims to be, and I said this very respectfully, claims to be simply restating and renewing traditional Catholic teaching. But as I said, there are many innovations in this document and some of which, um, well, I'll give you one more example just to get the ball rolling. Um, uh, as I said in my piece in Catholic World Report, uh, Pope John Paul II, who was a Pope from 1978 to 2005, the great Polish or Slavic Pope, um, uh, uh, Pope, Pope John Paul II argued that uh, the nation and the family are natural social communities. And in a book from the mid-1990s that came out in English the same year that he died, 2005, John Paul II added that they can never be replaced by something else. But if you look at uh, uh, Fratelli Tutti, Francis insists there's, there's little or no discussion of the family, which is really surprising given how central 
the family is to the church's own and old emphasis on subsidiarity, on the fact that the, the great task of human and social life and political life ought to be carried out at the lowest pos level possible. And, 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 and the family certainly plays a central role, not only in the economy of salvation, but in that very sort of proper ordering of the social order. But uh, for uh, Pope Francis, uh, uh, there's a very clear emphasis on the global, global humanity, you know, the world, and really instantiating social friendship as much as possible, not only through politics, but also through sort of global humanity. I think that is a new theme. Uh, and, and then there are these sort of, uh, I don't know if I want to call them throwaway lines, but they're, they really don't have any political significance. He talks about the importance of the local. And at one point he says local flavor, a whole section on local flavor. That sounds like, you know, having tacos in Mexico and, uh, you know, a certain kind of headdress in the Middle East and a certain kind of shawl in Kenya. Local flavor certainly does add to the variety and diversity of humankind, but does it have much to do with the, the theme of social friendship? It seems to be um, neither a moral nor political cat category of any import. So uh, the, the Pope's emphasis in this encyclical is um, it's highly politicized. It's um, sort of predictably humanitarian. Um, and, you know, as I've said in a series of writings, I think Pope Francis simply has never given any thought to the possibility that humanitarianism and Christianity finally point in very different directions. Yeah. Uh, there's very little reference to Christ or the church in this encyclical. And strangely, almost all encyclicals are addressed to his fellow bishops and co-religionists. And then Holy Roman Pontiffs will always add, and to other Christians and men of goodwill. This letter is, sort of, is just addressed to the world. And uh, there's constant uh, invocations of, uh, of a Sufi grand imam who co-signed the Abu Dhabi statement uh, about all religions sort of being committed to the same you know, improvement of the world. 2019 document. So, you know, this uh, at least dozen times that I counted, the Pope uh, invokes the authority of uh, of uh, a certain grand imam who, uh, uh, my guess is, is not terribly representative of contemporary Islam. But there's a there's a commitment to a kind of religious pluralism or ecumenism that doesn't seem to recognize any essential differences, certainly between the Christian churches and non-Christian affirmations. So the tone of the letter, there's many good things in the letter, right? don't get me wrong, many, many fine things, including a very suggestive exe exegesis of the parable of the Good Samaritan from the Gospel of Luke. But the book's focus is very much on this worldly transformation, on a kind of humanitarian focus. And critics might say, it's hard to differentiate his vision of Christianity from the spirit of a kind of activist NGO. And again, I try not to say that, I'm not trying to say that polemically, it's just descriptive of his mode of thinking. Dan, is there an innovation about which you uh, wanted to maybe ask or talk? Well, it's very interesting. Yeah. Uh, I'll just make one uh, quick comment. Uh, uh, in uh, speaking with people either in the Vatican or journalists, this point you just raised, uh, and maybe it's an obvious one, uh, but not to all people, this reference to the Islamic situation and his visit to Al-Azhar. And of course, as you know, and many others do, it was public that uh, Benedict was not uh, sort of in line or in step with seeing the Muslim situation as a sort of theological, uh, or not a sort of, a theological dialogue that was possible between the Vatican and, uh, and the Muslim world, and in particular institutions like, or the institution of Al-Azhar. And so there are many who commented just as you did uh, with respect to this sort of, uh, what can we say, in widening to the periphery uh, and Islam being a sort of major target in that sense and, and not, a, not a, a traditional for the Jesuits 
in terms of their outreach geographically uh, from, from the 16th century. So that was very interesting. And then I was hoping that when we get to the, and I don't want to step on Mike's uh, line of questioning, but just as an add-on here, and we can always pick it up later if you care to, uh, looking at John Paul's work, as you say, uh, solidarity was a key concept. He spent quite a bit of time on, not fraternity, but solidarity. Benedict uh, picked up solidarity, of course, as you rightfully point out, the building of one on another and reinforcing uh, encyclical themes, uh, in this case, the social themes. Uh, whereas for uh, uh, the current Pope, uh, Francis, uh, fraternity. Uh, so we're working our way through the French Revolution. <laughs> Uh, not a metier, although a metier could fit with fraternity, solidarity, obviously, and charity. But uh, there may be no comment there you wish to make, or maybe I maybe it's not a uh, sort of regnant question given the time we had. But it was interesting to see those three those three words with Benedict in between, trying to to sort of wrestle with both of those. Yeah, uh, let me let me say about Islam. This pope is. Uh, speaks very rarely about the situation of the imperiled and embattled Christian communities in the Arab and Islamic world. And I think if there are two places in the world where Christians, the Christian churches face sustained uh, if persecution and harassment, it's the Islamic world and the sort of remnants of the communist world like China. And his record in those areas is not uh, particularly impressive or admirable. He seems to believe that Islam is just another Abrahamic religion. And I think Pope Benedict was much more sensitive to the, the fact that the dominant currents of Islam had subordinated the, the, the reason of God to his will, a kind of divine voluntarism, which is very easily mirrored by a kind of human voluntarism, you know, a kind of aggressive violence prone Islam, perhaps not the only or dominant current, but a, but a major one. You know, Muslims are not encouraged to read the Old or New Testament. Everything you want to know about Mary and Jesus and uh, Isaac and Abraham and Moses is in the Quran. The problem, of course, is the Jesus of the Quran was not crucified. He did not rise from the dead. He was not the son of God, et cetera, et cetera. So I think when people in the spirit of soft ecumenism say, you know, Islam along with Christianity and Judaism is a, re a, a religion of the book, um, they're wrong. And that's not to say we should not cultivate relations with thoughtful uh, Muslims, but it is to say that uh, the kind of ecumenical dialogue that's possible among Christian churches or between Christians and Jews, I think is not really possible with the Islamic world for all sorts of reasons, a few of which I just elucidated. Um, remind me your second. Uh, solidarity. Yeah, solidarity. You know, I, As it relates to charity. Uh, yeah, yeah. As I point out in my uh, article in Catholic World Report, there is one fleeting passing reference to subsidiarity. Um, and I, I say, and it was a very carefully chosen formulation, that solidarity without subsidiarity is pretty thin gruel. Because if solidarity just means sort of humanitarian brotherhood, I think it becomes, uh, it loses the concreteness of personal responsibility, of the face-to-face -face enc face -face encounter which is so important, the personalism so important to the Christian religion. Fraternity is very interesting. Uh, Michael Warren Davis, who's the editor of Crisis Magazine, uh, he had criticized me when I published an article in National Review in January called The Wayward Shepherd. Uh, and, you know, uh, but now he, he, he wrote this scathing denunciation at Crisis Magazine of the new encyclical. And he per was particularly taken back by the uh, evocation of uh, liberté, égalité, fraternité, the great revolutionary slogan of the French Revolution. The Pope seems not to be aware that coercive fraternity can be the source of despotism. In my Catholic World Report piece, I quote the Comte de Chambord, a French aristocrat turned revolutionary, who famously said before the National Assembly, be my brother or I will kill you. And I think it was the politicization of fraternity as opposed to 
a sort of more modest effort at encouraging common citizenship and fellow feeling, let's say you had in uh, the Anglo-American world that had much to do with uh, proto-totalitarianism of the French Revolution. I don't mean to suggest in any way that Pope Francis is advocating coercive totalitarianism. He's not. But I think he's inattentive. That would be the generous way of putting it. Blind would be the uh, less uh, generous way of putting it. He's inattentive to uh, the dangers of what he calls a politics of love when it's tied to a kind of centralizing political project. Now, let me add, the talk about a politics of love is not new to Pope Francis. Uh, Paul VI and John Paul II spoke about a civilization of love. And, uh, but they were much more attentive. They did never identified love with, uh, you know, the um, instantiation of fraternity and charity at the level of global humanity. I think that's a new emphasis and a misplaced emphasis with Pope uh, Francis. Um, Why don't we uh, we'll take a break there and then talk in the next part about just that uh, new emphasis? Uh, That'll be great. NGOs, let's talk about the politicization of charity with which we try to follow at the Giving Review. But uh, yeah, why don't we take a break and consider that part one and then uh, pick up uh, with Perfect. part two in a bit. Thanks.